Unico, with Sanrio, Tezuka, and Madhouse coming together to give your kids nightmares. We have Toshio Harata as director here, and he is a mainstay at the OS and has worked on many projects that will be coming in the future, as well as some stuff at Sanrio before, like the animation of Ringing Bell. Along with him comes Masahiko Sato, who was on the OST, working prior on stories like Belladonna and some extra music on Grave of the Fireflies. So this person definitely knows their sadness, and they're going to need to. Sanrio has a way of loosening you up with a silliness before sticking in the blade. What we assume at the beginning seems like a, a nice, lovable time ended pretty quickly as soon as we hear that Unico must die. Banished. He's just too lovable. Unico is supposed to bring love and happiness wherever he goes. But in this Greek myth setup, the gods have a sort of jealousy towards him. As they say, happiness should be earned. So they believe banishing Unico is the only response. So yeah, instead of a uh, Care Bears, we may be getting the Odyssey here. And surely you definitely wouldn't know it in the first look. The opening musical is very sugary, in fact, to a point of being sickly. You know, that playful mix of synth and brass. They're just having fun. Boom. We're in the middle of No Man Land even with a little bit of mixing of live action and animation together. The real subtext appears. Loneliness. Isolation. Sadness. Unico has nothing now. No friends. No family. No place to be. Nothing but his isolation. You're throwing a magical mascot into purgatory. The first person he meets is the Devil of Solitude. And what a misdirection that is. And that's all pushed further by its gloomy, gothic, monochrome shots. But yeah, as we go on, I could do without all the singing. It's given me those uh, toey flashbacks and... It's not, it's not great. Every song is pretty much the same thing. The burden seems too much for Unico because in his serious sorrow, he was willing to give up his powers for companionship. Even if his playmate is kind of abusive and knocks him into literally the ocean of the abyss to drown and then leaves him there for a good little while. Well, that's it. The dread really fills the environment. It's weighted. Yet, while sinking into hopelessness, we do get to rise at the last moment, restoring the faith before being dragged back down again. Turns out Unico has a friend in the little devil after all. But while things are looking restored and happy once again, we realize the gods have found Unico and that he must disappear. Upon hitting the second world, in world two we may be in a luscious lakeside, but there is a essence of abandonment everywhere. That harrowing loneliness fills everyone that Unico meets. Even the lighter moments have a melancholy in the distance. And well, yeah, it starts to dip a little bit in the middle here, but there still is this deep sadness within. When things start to come together again, when Unico's powers help out these people, and they start to learn the error of their ways, a new darkness breeds. A Dasaki boy, looking like a vampire or a wizard, he brings temptation, seeping his claws into the forest. This Baron is ethereal and stoic, almost out of a completely different film. And that's where I sort of want to get into the attention to detail, of smaller body language. That's where Unico mainly has its animation feats. Stuff like the warped dancing of Chow when she is under the influence, the agileness of Unico, the tail wags of his excitement, the big expressive face, he's light and nimble, the small demon and his sort of schlubby fidgeting persona along with his aggressive attitude definitely helps build up the characters in the story which is the heart of it all. And to say anything about Unico as a character, He's a really good friend to these people. He works hard. I mean, how many of your friends will sword fight for you? Or go for the joust, just to protect you from a, a strange, creepy baron that uh, has questionable motives? Now we've spent so long in the sort of vibrant element, we get the reverse situation, where the darkness takes hold of the forest, turning it into a hellscape. Bleakness. A hydra of demon-like proportion. The literal devil appears in front of us. It's inventive, I'll give it that. And it looks beautiful. In the end, Unico uses his valiant self-sacrificing attitude to save people beyond himself in which he makes what looks to be the ultimate sacrifice luckily unico's powers are strongest when his friends care and love for him and those he befriended come to him from all over with compassion and selflessness themselves awakening unico's true power saving everyone through the depression the isolation of darkness unico doesn't take half measures even after defeating the he has to leave again there is no resolution to his sadness. He realizes that staying with his friends will put them in mortal danger, and that leaving is the best thing he could do for them. And that's maturity. That he brings a unity and joy to others, but can't keep it himself? It's potent. And really gets to the core of the story. 
happiness is fleeting and it's hard to catch on to. The pursuit for happiness is a lifelong goal. We are left in the credits to reflect the tragedy of Unico. And for a kid's film, like I said, they didn't pull any punches. The weight is heavy, the message strong. But I'm not okay with that. To have watched Unico be forced into this situation, to never escape. Surely his happy ending must come at some point. I know there's a sequel. Hopefully, hopefully this Odyssey is given a resolution. The original Unico movie is based off two different little shorts that were sort of stitched together, and I think they did a pretty good job of making that at least work, but it does feel like a piece of a bigger story. Will Unico ever escape the gods? Well, two years later, Unico and the Magic Island was released, and this time we're only based on one tale, so they have a little bit more focus here. We have Moribi Murano as the director this time, and he did work on the first one with minor little um, assistant parts. OST changed. Now it's Nosomi Aoki, who worked on things like Galaxy Express 3.9, and a favorite of the company, animation director Kazu Tomi Sawa. Did a lot of sort of animation direction in the future with the company, a lot of character designs coming up, especially in the next film, but does a undeniable impressive job in the magical island. Now to go back to Tezuka, I believe that these films hold his intention most of all. In the early days of Toei, Tezuka would work on projects like his Monkey King sort of adaptation. However, he was burnt by Toei's decision not to go with some of his more potent emotional stings. They went with a more happy ending. And they told him, no, you can't end a kid's film with sorrow. It has to be happy. And he didn't like that. That's not the kind of stories he wants to tell. No Hollywood happiness here. He wants his audience to make their own judgments. And if I could say anything, the first Unico movie does a beautiful job of that. But how will the Island of Magic fare? We start where we left off. But this is the kicker here. Something I didn't expect to happen. The wind that saved Unico removes his memories. They take away everything of our prior journey. The trauma, the horrific, the friendship, all of it is gone now. Unico is a blank slate still destined to the same job that he did before. And he doesn't know it. He's once again alone and confused and treated with malicious intention. In a forest, they follow a flute. Well, we meet a suspicious boy. There seems to be some sorrow in his heart too. But then we see his trickster persona. The sadness has waned from the prior film into this more weird, macabre sense with the existentialness pushed far out into the horizon line. Even the film itself seems to want you to forget about all that stuff in the last one. This is a different kind of story. One that's more action-packed, a little bit more immediate, more of an odyssey. We have a real antagonist, an even deviouser and darker <laughs> persona than we've seen before. Characters that uh, appear to be evil in this story have a little bit more dimension than the prior one. Toby looks to use magic as a fast fix to make his family's life better. But at what cost? Is richness through magic a path to happiness? And that's really the question that Unico continues to posit. How do we get to happiness? Is it through hard work? Is there a quick and easy fix towards a happier life? Certainly the head magician would think not. The dissonant pianos, the circling strings, the low-bearing cello line. We understand this person is not to be trifled with. A devious force that has questionable and mysterious interests, which the more you find out, the more messed up it becomes. Turning people into living dolls, pretty much slaves to his will, that all must be taken to a magical island. But even so, this is a family drama. This is all about him interacting with a family and trying to make their life better. The setting is wider, we stay in this story for longer, and that gives it a slight more vividness. Even if I would say you lose something in the character, the more personal, character-based, emotional relationships of the prior picture have been stripped out for something spectacular. Unico's first film didn't need things like comic relief sidekicks for a, a semi-villain or, or the occasional goofiness that makes the film less sorrowful, less potent in the long run. Living dolls make up the walls of this castle. It's an unsettling idea, and Yuko must save a family who've been entangled into this 
horror story. But alongside that horror story, we have these expert little vignette sequences. The toy wall is just a visual splendor of elegance. Musical dance, I think, plays to the director's strengths. The speed and color in the finale is in overdrive. The way they punch at you, the Monster Valley scene in particular, unbelievably Sokuga based. And yeah, there's less redundancy maybe here. It's a little bit more tighter because of how it is structured. And other characters kind of lose all their purpose and are thrown away by the story. In that regard, those characters aren't necessarily as refined. But there is one particular moment where the beauty and emotional relationship between characters come together in a unbelievable and triumphant sequence. Breathes new levels of hope not seen in the first film, albeit that the lesson learned in the scene is something that Unico would have learned in the last film. But I suppose he did lose his memories, so I'll give him I'll give him a pass on that one. The wizard himself, the Grand Wizard, has an unexpectedly existential and horrific backstory. They're given wider intentions for their actions than I could have possibly expected, involving his life as a puppet that was thrown away, left at the edge of the world to spend its time alone for hundreds of years, where it was affected by the ethereal sunlight enough that one day it was given life, and from that life came weird, dark, magical powers. For its life, that puppet did play the villainous role, and that's what it was praised for. So, that's what it does. It makes up the darkest and most evil plans for the sake of an audience that doesn't exist anymore. I wouldn't say the animation on the whole is as intricate as the first film. Barring the exception of the Grand Wizard himself, who squashes and stretches with such a delightful pleasure is almost magnetic to watch. In the climactic finisher, we get out that jazz guitar and that starts picking it and it goes absolutely crazy. Wizard duel. We have a wizard duel here. Moving past the fireworks, what both these films do a great job of is showing Unico's self-sacrifice and empathy. He shows pity on the magic man, Kukuruku, who surely is lonely and bitter by this point. Unico knows that his magic can beat him, but he'd rather not kill him. He wants to show him compassion and kindness that ends up whistling through the hatred that Kuruku feeds on. And intentionally so. Even if Unico wants to be his friend, that ends up settling his fate in the long run. He sizzles out, left as a pile of broken puppet trees. The island collapses, the living dolls become a reality, and everything is saved. But once again, Unico is nowhere to be seen. As they say, leaving is his destiny. I noticed during my research that in the manga it says that Unico would face all manner of issues that he'd have to deal with, from things like environmentalism to interracial marriage, which in retrospect sounds unintentionally hilarious. Unico's good, but I don't know if he can beat systemic issues by transforming into a Pegasus and skewing his opposition. So I'm glad that in, when they turn these into uh, theatrical films, they chose the goals that seemed more suited for the kind of experience they would want. An adventure story. And if anything, Magical Island is an even better adventure story for kids. Albeit my preference is probably in the original film. Though the Island of Magic has its own creepy and weird texture that gives it its own personality. But both tell the same story, and that story is of the true horror of Unico's experience. To be hunted by the gods, to bring happiness but never keep it, losing his memories on every escape. You realize in that moment, Unico will never be allowed to go home. He'll never finish his story. He isn't Homer, he's Sisyphus, doomed to repeat this destiny forever. <laughs> 